I once had a patient wake up after surgery telling me they saw their whole life flash past their eyes. They told me they literally felt like a whole new person. They had fallen asleep with profound depression and woke up with a dramatic change in self-representation even though this surgery was just a minor ankle surgery. No one had told them that they were going to be in a deep medical coma under anesthesia, no matter how small that surgery was. And in that deep medical coma, we bring you to the edge of death while you're in that altered state of consciousness, and we're able to bring you back. That's one of the miracles of modern medicine. I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And I'm going to share with you how we descend into those depths of anesthesia so your body can safely tolerate surgery and how we bring you out of it. And as an added bonus, I'm gonna share what happens in between those two, where in the depths of your subconscious, some profound healing can take place. The first step of anesthesia is literally to approach death so that your body can be in a place where it can tolerate the surgery because if your body isn't fully anesthetized and fully put to sleep, it could kick or scream or hurt yourself or others around you. It's why we use medications like the classic white medication propofol here, and sometimes other medications like midazolam here, a powerful benzodiazepine. And we also use anesthesia gas and all sorts of other IV medications to help your body safely go through the surgery process. Your body has to be so deep under anesthesia and sometimes even paralyzed to let us do what we need to do to it, such as place this type of metal in your mouth to place a breathing tube to breathe for you while you're having surgery. The problem is that we can't just turn off the nerves in your brain without turning off the nerves everywhere else in your body. And that's why the nerves in your heart can be turned off. And that's the main toxicity of anesthesia, literally turning off the nerves in your heart and causing someone to potentially go into cardiac arrest. So anesthesia is really the ultimate balancing act. And yeah, your life is in the hands of your anesthesiologist and your other doctors in the room while you're having surgery. And it's why we go to school for tens of years and have all the life support medications around you so that we can guide you safely through this process. It's not meant to be scary, but it's meant for you to know how important it is to be honest with your doctor about your medical conditions so that we can take care of you when you can't speak to us when you're in that medical coma. Once surgery is over, we need to help bring you back out of the depths of that medical coma. And some medications have an antidote. In fact, there's lots of antidotes throughout the world. You can think of natural ones like atropine. We use atropine specifically from the belladonna plant to reverse the effects of organophosphate poisoning. And there are some synthetic medications that we've developed that can reverse the effects of some anesthesia agents. Things like naloxone or Narcan to reverse opioids, flumazenil to reverse benzodiazepines like midazolam or alprazolam, also called Xanax, and medications like glycopyrrolate and neostigmine to reverse some muscle relaxants or paralyzing agents so that you can use your muscles again. You don't want to regain consciousness before your muscles are back online, otherwise it can be a terrifying feeling to not be able to move in your own body. However, most anesthesia medications that turn your mind off don't have reversal agents. I'm talking things like propofol and the anesthesia gases that you inhale that make their way to your brain from your lungs through your bloodstream, ultimately to your brainstem and brain. Those medications need to be either exhaled out in the case of anesthesia gases, and as you exhale them out, they equilibrize with the levels in your brain and your brain levels slowly decrease as you continue to exhale them. And other medications like the white stuff propofol or ketamine have to go through your liver or kidneys to be metabolized and ultimately excreted from your body. And once they come out of your body, the levels in your brain also equilibrate to a lower level so that you slowly regain normal consciousness. Unfortunately, we don't have any medications that can rush that process. It needs to happen on its own. There are some folks who will use IV caffeine, sometimes in pediatric patients like very young infants, but that's not a particularly effective reversal for the altered state of consciousness that anesthesia puts you in. There are some factors that determine who wakes up faster or slower from anesthesia. Some things like the melanocortin-1 gene that might dictate who has red hair. There are some mild effects that are noted in folks with red hair who are more resistant to anesthesia, perhaps because they're faster at metabolizing it so that they wake up faster or need higher doses. There are also other genes that likely influence our metabolism of certain anesthetics. We know a very small number of them, but there's likely hundreds if not thousands more that we have not yet discovered. 
discovered. And it also depends on what medications and drugs your brain has seen because some medications or drugs can increase your metabolism or increase your resistance to certain anesthetic agents. And if you've been exposed to those drugs or substances, then you might need more anesthesia to stay asleep and you might wake up faster from a given dose of anesthesia. As you wake up from surgery, lots of different things can happen. Often your vital signs might go up or down, your breathing rate becomes very irregular for a short period of time, your eyes begin to look in different directions, and they might get really red around your pupils. This is the emergence process, which is the naturally occurring coming out from that deep anesthesia coma. Some folks might experience emergence delirium and come out kicking and screaming or cussing or trying to otherwise hurt themselves or others around them. We don't always know why this happens. We used to think it might be related to rapidly coming out of the depths of anesthesia and that just makes the brain go haywire. But lots of other studies have shown that if you come out really slowly, this same emergence delirium can still occur. Another big contributor is our mental health and how we fall asleep. Certainly in my clinical practice, I've observed patients who fall asleep very angry, frustrated, or otherwise emotional, wake up more angry, frustrated, or otherwise emotional. It's not every single patient, but if there's something we can do to help you fall asleep more smoothly, more gracefully, I suspect in many cases, if not all, the patients will also wake up more comfortably with a lower chance of emergence delirium. There's no cost and no side effect to treating patients right and helping them feel comfortable. So it seems like a no brainer to help you wake up better out of surgery by helping you go into the depths of anesthesia more comfortably as well. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below if you have ever fallen asleep feeling very anxious or emotional and whether you think that impacted how your surgery went or how you woke up. And as always, if you're learning something new, please hit that like button and share what you're learning with your loved ones. And now for the most curious part of what happens in between plunging into the depths of anesthesia and emerging from them on the other side. The hidden subconscious between these two parts of surgery is mysterious because we used to think that patients were just brain dead and had no idea what was going on. And then came along this idea of the body keeping score. Have you ever heard this before? It appears to be very real and pretty spooky at that. A recent study showed that if you place headphones over patients who are in general anesthesia and play back recordings of positive affirmations, it impacts how much pain they wake up in. Another curious study anesthetized volunteers and then played back recordings of an emergency crisis situation going on in the operating room. Some patients woke up feeling like something had gone wrong around them while they were under, even though they were presumably completely unconscious with their brain literally, quote, turned off. And more recently, the incredible healing effects of patients under ketamine has demonstrated that a lot of things are happening within our brain, perhaps in the subconscious, that underlies so much of our self-representation and our healing potential. It's one of the reasons I started a ketamine healing practice to help patients harness that healing potential that can happen in our subconscious as unlocked by some of these altered states of consciousness like anesthesia. But what's even more fascinating is that it's not just restricted to chemically induced altered states of consciousness, but even non-medically induced ones, like when you're sleeping at night and dreaming or in deep meditative states. Whether it's surgery or sleeping at night, when we allow something to happen to our body and we surrender to the experience, some healing can happen in there, even though we cannot fully explain it with modern medical science yet today. And instead of ignoring or avoiding this curiosity, perhaps we should embrace it and ask more questions about what our true healing potential is, even if we're not fully conscious when that healing is happening. You can learn about my healing practice in San Francisco by visiting claris-health.com, linked in the description below. And be sure to hit that like button and share what you learned with others so that they can also advocate to receive the best possible healthcare. And let me know in the comments what you wanna learn about in our next video. Remember, you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told.